uh, today's webinar is the seventh in the series being organized by COPAM. The previous webinars covered several interesting practices of integrating health and microfinance. To give you some idea, we had webinars on uh, for partnerships forged by Equita Small Finance Bank with healthcare providers, clean water supplies in a sustainable way by SKD RDP, uh, NGO MFI in Karnataka, community health workers promoted by Cash Poor Microcredit, and Healing Fields Foundation in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. We also had webinars on cost effective insurance and healthcare provided by Gramin Kuta and SAS Purna Arogya in Assam and Karnataka. Health financing through mutual models by Uplift Mutual. These were the webinars we had in the past, and uh, this is the seventh we are going to have today. As I see that some of the participants who may not be aware about Results Educational Fund, I would like to give a brief introduction. Results Educational Fund is a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit. Results, results mobilizes the voices of those who are passionate about influencing the policy decisions that will bring an end to poverty. Results has affiliates and partners across five continents and a network of volunteers all over the world. <laughs> Today's webinar on universal health coverage has three distinguished speakers. Firstly, Mark Rice. Mark Rice is Austral Results Australia's policy and advocacy manager. Mark has been associated with Results Australia for the last 30 years in various capacities. Mark also has worked as a researcher and financial advisor to the Australian federal government and for the state of Queensland. He has a master's degree in public administration. Mark is based in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Saumitra Datta, the chief technical officer of Freedom from Hunger India Trust, has 28 years of experience in the field of community health and development. He is currently based in Calcutta and involved in providing technical assistance to MFIs and NGOs in India to integrate health, nutrition, and, wa and wash with microfinance programs. Saumitro has developed several community-based health training modules. Dr. Datta has a medical degree with PhD in health management. Dr. Shoman Saha, he is an assistant professor with the Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhinagar. His work areas include economic assessment of health programs, impact evaluation, health financing, and health systems convergence. Soman holds a PhD from the University of Melbourne, Australia. Coming to the contents of today's webinar, Mark Rice will introduce us to universal health coverage. Saumitro will share what they have learned from a health diaries research project that captured health events in the lives of 45 women in Jharkhand and West Bengal. Soman Saha will talk about how universal health coverage is playing out in India. Their presentations will be followed by an open discussion in which all the participants are encouraged to pose questions to the speakers. I think Sabina has already explained how you could use the chat box for posing the questions. And you may also offer your own experiences of promoting health. And we will close the webinar hearing Mark Rice again about the engagement of international civil society in the global universal health coverage movement. Now I request Mark to make his presentation. Mark. Thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, for explaining how we're going to proceed today. So uh, the topic I have is uh, an introduction to universal health coverage. And 
uh, the presentation is pitched in a way that it's, a, it's uh, for people who are new to the topic of universal health coverage. So for some of you, uh, it, you may actually have some knowledge and I may be telling you some things you'll know already. Um, but uh, I think for other, pe yeah, for other people, what I'm uh, going to be saying, uh, it will be um, new information. And uh, so um, we'll have the next slide, please. Uh, and uh, yes, so uh, the topic I've got is Universal Health Coverage 101. And uh, so on our next slide, we've got a, a brief explanation of uh, and a definition of what universal health coverage is. And I think it's worthwhile breaking down this fairly long sentence into its different components so that uh, we can see what um, what we mean when we speak about universal health coverage. So it says that all people and communities have access to promotive, preventative, curative, rehabilitative and palliative health services. So uh, in other words, um, in better information about health um, actions such as vaccines that prevent disease, uh, curing illnesses, uh, achieving rehabilitation from illness and injury, and palliative uh, relief of symptoms. Um, those services and uh, are all part of universal health coverage, and they also need to be sufficient in quality to be effective, and also that they're affordable. So uh, that people in the community who are using those services are not going to be uh, are, not, are not going to experience hardship uh, as a result of health treatment and I think that's I mean that can be a uh, an issue in many countries in the world um, even for some people in Australia unexpected health events can actually impose significant costs and in some cases hardship uh, next slide please Uh, so the next point is that the universal health coverage is uh, part of the sustainable development goals. Uh, goal three is good health and well-being, and uh, so it's a it's a broader approach to health than was in the the Millennium Development Goals that had some specific goals on diseases and child survival. Uh, so. Under goal three, we've got a target of achieving universal coverage, and that has the, the two components of coverage of essential health services and affordable and quality medicines, uh, and also financial protection for all. Um, and I think that the quality medicines part, it would be something I think that some of the participants uh, in, in the call would uh, see as being important because we do see occasionally stories about poor quality vaccines or treatments that uh, can actually undermine what well, they have damaging effects on people's health but also they undermine confidence in the public health system. Um, next slide please. Uh, so the um, it's more so getting specifically to the components of universal health coverage. Uh, it means that uh, people can obtain assistance and treatment from uh, a suitably trained health worker. And obviously, depending on the, the nature of the service, that level of training would need to be appropriate. Uh, it also means obtaining the medicines and other treatment that are necessary. It also means having a means of paying for the services. And that can be, it may be for some services, uh, those that are provided by government free of charge. It can also be those that are covered by insurance, or it could mean a, a low affordable contribution by the, the person using the service. Um, it also means do our um, health services have suitable policies and procedures and that the government has the information it requires to plan and um, manage health services and that all of those features are available to all people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we now have a short video, uh, which we'll play. Uh, it runs for about two minutes and it's created by the World Bank and it uses a, um, 
uh, an animation of one person's case to show uh, what uh, universal health coverage means in practice. So um, uh, we can now proceed with playing the video. DSK, on oh, okay. Um, DSK, you may not have checked the box to share your computer audio. So I'm gonna share my screen. Which meant? No, never mind. Except nobody can Which see meant? your. Now, when Maya went to school, she could raise her hand. A local clinic, skilled doctors, affordable care, and adequate medical supplies all sound like simple things, but they aren't. In many countries, families just like Maya's risk falling into poverty if they seek the medical care that they need. Yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody, sorry about that. I'm going to share my screen. You guys should be able to see that, and you should be able to hear the audio. This is Maya, raising her hand for the first time ever. For Maya's family, it's their proudest moment ever, because that's the moment every family sees when their child goes to school. It seems like it shouldn't take a lot of work for one little girl to raise her hand, but it does. Because not that long ago, Maya couldn't raise her hand at all. And it all started with a rock. A small rock that made Maya trip and fall. A fall that required a visit to a local clinic. A local clinic that provided affordable, quality care. Affordable, quality care that allowed Maya to be examined by a skilled doctor who wrapped Maya's arm in a cast that she wore until her arm healed. Which meant that when Maya went to school, she could raise her hand. A local clinic, skilled doctors, affordable care, and adequate medical supplies all sound like simple things, but they aren't. In many countries, families just like Maya's risk falling into poverty if they seek the medical care that they need. Luckily for Maya, her country made the decision that health care should lift people up instead of knock them down. That families shouldn't have to decide between buying medicine and buying food. And that a broken arm doesn't mean going broke. They created a health system where everyone participates and everyone benefits. Their commitment to ensuring that all households can afford health care means that they have healthy citizens who create healthy communities. And healthy communities create a healthy country. It took a lot of hard work to help Maya raise her hand. But it wasn't just the doctor or the clinic or the cast or even the affordable care. It was all of these things working together as part of a strong health system. Health systems create healthy futures where everyone can thrive, everyone can contribute, and everyone can raise their hands. Great. All right. Um, DSK, you want to take back over the share function. Share your screen again. Yeah. And I think that concluded the presentation part for uh, uh, introducing universal health coverage. I might just check if there are any quick questions before we move uh, to the next speaker. Uh, are there any questions, you can put them in the chat box or if you'd like, you, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, DSK, you need to share the PowerPoint. So unshare, unshare your screen, stop share, and then select the PowerPoint to share. Okay, good. That worked. Are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat box. And... If you wanted to chat, you have to unmute yourself. Lower left-hand corner, there's a microphone there that says mute. If uh, you're muted, there's a line over the microphone. 
right, why don't we go ahead and go to Shamitra. Hi, everyone. Uh, am I audible? You are. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yes. Uh, taking from Mark, I'm getting into uh, some specific research, uh, which would provide some inputs related to what we're looking for under universal health coverage. Uh, but before that, a bit of UHC, uh, why UHC matters in India. Uh, the slide, please, CSK. Uh, well, as you can see, the health expenditure contributes to poverty, 3.6% with rural, the urban 2.9%. If I put it in one single way, is that uh, almost every year, it's about 12 million or 63, 12 million families or 63 million people are pushed into poverty uh, because of health expenditure. And as you can see, the out-of-the-pocket expenditure, 62.6%, only the rest is covered by the government or insurance. Uh, and not only that, current primary health care that we have across India, the focus is primarily on the mother and child health and to some extent, communicable diseases. So it covers only 20% of the overall health care needs. When you really look at the promotive, palliative, rehabilitative, those things are not there really. And finally, as I move into a health diary uh, to focus more on health cost, you can see that's the biggest hurdle. Um, under universal health coverage in India, followed by focusing on the primary health care supplies. Next. Well, this is just giving you in a nutshell. Don't get into the nitty gritties of the words, but primarily those orange headings. So this is the program that we are currently implementing in uh, the state of West Bengal and Charkhand with two partners. And this is called Marsh Sishu Shastha, Mother and Child Health. Of course, we have this whole concept of universal health coverage, some of the strategies which are required. So what we did as a part of the major interventions, as you can see on the left, is health education. Because unless uh, the community is well educated in what to do, uh, it might be difficult for them to actually take care of the health as well as to seek services. So we focused on health education. And uh, then if you go down, uh, we did a part of health financing because as you can understand, it's not only education, but you need to have money to cover some of your costs. So we did uh, a part of as a health finance, health savings with one of our partners and then go right up. We also try to link with the local health providers in order to increase the access. So if you look at these three, uh, we wanted to give information. And then we wanted to link them with health providers and we also wanted to make sure that they at least think of some health financing. Uh, if you look at the other two, community practice, as we all know, in order that we can share uh, whatever is happening and that can also contribute to our new USC policies. And finally, at the end, our, uh, towards the, uh, at the bottom, if you see, that had been our major platform in order to uh, focus on uh, the mothers or the real beneficiaries through the self-help groups. Next, yes, okay. Well, coming to the health diaries. This is a specific research, basically. Um, it's, it's a series of surveys that took place with 45 women, 15 uh, in the ADS, one of our partners in West Bengal, 15 with Bandhan in West Bengal, and 15 in Charkhand, again with Bandha, it's 45 women. And we did 10 surveys over a period of eight months. Okay, so there were a gap of three to four weeks between each surveys. Each survey tracked health events and association associated costs, as well as special thematic interviews. For example, along with health uh, events and associated costs, we also have in one survey on gender and decision-making, one survey on livelihood, one survey food security, uh, health preference, etc. Next. Uh, there, was, there had been several questions, but for this webinar, we focused on four major questions that were there as a part of the survey. So the events, the health events that they experienced at home is responded. And what did they do? The next, whatever they did, what was the cost? And the third one was, 
whatever was the cost, how did they cover the cost? And the fourth, which is very important, what was the perceived burden of the cost? So these were the four major questions. Next, please. Uh, so if you look at this graph, uh, on the left-hand side, these are the total amount in rupees of the cost they bore, the respondents. On the right, of course, the percentage of the cost that they bore, and down, you have the x-axis, the number of surveys. It shows the survey from survey number two to survey number 10. Now, if you look at the bottom uh, line, the red one, that's basically indirect cost. So indirect cost means the travel, uh, going to the doctor, health centers, food, accommodations, loss wage, etc. And over the period it was found, it was on average, they spent 324 rupees on an average on the indirect cost. Uh, right above that, uh, the green one, is the direct cost. And the direct cost, of course, included the medicine, the doctor's fee, any, any lab tests, etc. Uh, and then you have the total cost. So the direct cost on an average was somewhere around 1400. The total cost, the dark blue one, it gives both direct and indirect, uh, which was roughly on average was 1700 somewhere around. But if you look at some point more towards the end of the survey, it went more than 2,500. This I'm talking about for one incidence, one special health incidence or event of a family of the respondent over a period of three weeks. So if you really look for monthly expenditure, it was actually 2,500 per respondent, okay, per month. And uh, so that, that's it. And if you really look at it towards the end, just before survey number eight, there had been flooding in that area. So nothing happened. They didn't even seek any health treatment. And after that, there was a spike to nine and 10 because the health costs increased because then they sought uh, treatment. Uh, the last the line, the broken line, is basically the felt costs that was significant. The felt costs also, as you can see, moved along with the total cost. And the burden they felt basically around survey number eight, nine. Okay, I'll explain further in the next slide, please. So as, as for the definition, the catastrophic health costs, I mean, the family gets into a catastrophic situation, is basically when it's more than 10% uh, of the monthly income or expenditures. Okay, the government of India puts it at 6.9%. Uh, uh, but if you see here, whether this average health expenditures, 2,500 per month per household, even if we look at the two indicators of poverty, the one which is $3.10 less than that, it is the lowest 18%. And if you look at the high, which we have compared with our national poverty line, $2.5, it is 57%. So it is much, much more than the 10%. So if you look on the right hand side, the catastrophe, it was catastrophic for all poverty lines. And most of them, more than 50%, almost 58% felt the burden uh, of this cost. And it's, of course, those who had high, high health cost, they felt it even more. Next, please. This is just one of the examples because we had taken pregnant women. Uh, so we took the prenatal cost. Uh, and as we all know, this is something the government usually takes care of. And there's hardly any cost for this. However, while doing this survey over the period, we found, uh, of course, of all these important costs, like the doctor's fee, medicine, tests, and transport, uh, if you look at the first row, had no cost, uh, which means these respondents didn't have, didn't have to spend anything. Interestingly, under medicine, there were only 22% of the respondents who did not spend anything on medicine. So you can imagine nearly 80% of them actually spent on medicine, and that was the highest cost, 1,303. So that's an important aspect. Even the prenatal care, the cost of medicine was highest. And if you really look uh, across in India, of the out-of-pocket expenditure, the highest expenditure 
is on medicine. Next, please. Uh, key findings. DSK loss that DSK just minimize the Skype. Okay, well, these are some of the key findings based on the respondents, what they gave. Uh, they had the problem of signing up the RSP. Right? Uh, some of them, were, of course, were not aware of it. And I think there was some online registration. So whatever would be the cost, 62 person had problem. The next is in order to cover the cost, of course, the most important for them was the savings, of whatever they had at home were their own savings or their husband's savings, but it was basically the savings. And then once that was over, then they went for borrow with friends, relatives, and of course later on with the money lenders or mortgage. That's how it happened, even for prenatal care. Uh, the government health schemes insufficient, as we all know. Uh, nearly 86% of the population is not covered under any health scheme. And of course the household tried to save for health expenses, and that's also very interesting. Especially when a mother gets pregnant, they usually go for the health savings. And of course, as I also said, though it's very new, ADS has started health savings in a very small way. Uh, but that's something that these women are doing in addition to their regular business savings. Next, please. Even with the current USC or the plan that the government has, the uh, out of expense, out of pocket expense would still continue. So the question here is, especially the financial service providers, what could be the role, considering that, as I mentioned, health cost is one of the biggest, or probably the biggest hurdle. So how we can cover the financial gap and also the demand, in fact, health education or in, in terms of promoting health, preventing health is very important. And as you see, the, uh, the products we found as a the result of this health diary is basically the features that require only two. One, it has to be very quick. I mean, the access to money has to be quick. So I just put it colloquially, we have to cut the red tape. So food, uh, the money should be available. And the second, it should be enough to match out of the pocket costs. So these were the key findings. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Um, hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, so Oh, great. <laughs> uh, I had to switch to my mobile device to, uh, because my laptop sound was having a problem. Anyway, uh, so continuing to the discussions which Mark and Shomitra had, uh, and Shomitra has succinctly pointed out some of the uh, key issues from a micro level uh, health diary method. I would take you now to what is happening at a country level as far as the moving towards universal health care is concerned. Mark has rightly pointed out what are the key dimensions and definitions of universal health care. Uh, but one need to understand that universal health care is a journey and not a destination. So where is India basically into this journey? How far has it moved? Traditionally, if you look into this country, India, uh, health has not been a political priority and those of you and many of you are from India, you know that you know, we never probably have an election won or lost based on health agenda, how has the government performed on health. So hence, health has never been part of our political priority. So uh, now, as Shomitra mentioned, our primary healthcare packages that we have so far are focused mostly on mother and child health as well as infectious and communicable diseases that addresses about 20% of the healthcare needs. Most of you know that India is in a process of uh, epidemiological transition 
from communicable disease, we have non-communicable disease as well as a triple burden of emerging and re-emerging condition. High out-of-pocket expenditure is another problem that Shumitra has highlighted. Now, within this context, uh, we have this third national health policy, which came in 2017. This policy has been very progressive in line with the global discourse. I want to basically highlight two parts of this policy. Now, when we say India has high out-of-pocket expenditure, one of the reasons that has been highlighted is that government spends quite less in healthcare. So this national health policy basically uh, proposed that to increase health expenditure by the government as a percentage of our gross domestic product from the existing 1.15% to 2.5% by 2025, as well as increase uh, the state sector's health spending to more than 8% of their budget by 2020. I think that is be most critical for India on its journey to universal health care because in India, health is a state subject unless states take up the responsibility, unless the state increases the spending, uh, it will never be able to move towards universal health care only by increasing the central spending on health care. Now within this context, I want to bring this concept of Ayushman Bharat, an initiative which was announced in the last budget uh, and this was, you know, rated as the world's largest healthcare program, often told as Modi care program, I think uh, after Obamacare as we know in the United States. So I, I want to basically highlight uh, two components. Now, when we talk about Ayushman Bharat, I think the popular media has taken up one important scheme, National Health Protection Scheme as Ayushman Bharat, that is equated to Ayushman Bharat, that is providing health protection of five lakh uh, to every uh, family. But I want to basically dig deep into that what are the two main components of Ayushman Bharat. First is the component of comprehensive primary health care. So Ayushman Bharat recognizes that unless primary health care systems improves in India, uh, India will not be able to move towards universal health care. It will not be able to reduce the burden of out-of-pocket expenditure on health care. So we will, in the next slide, we will discuss more about this comprehensive primary health care. The other part of the Ayushman Bharat program is basically the National Health Protection Scheme, which is very widely discussed in popular media. So I will come to that as well. But if you look into this in totality, it basically this Ayushman Bharat program talks about the continuum of care from primary to secondary and to tertiary care. The idea is that if we have developed a, a good primary health care system, which is responsive to the changing epidemiological burden, or these transitions, their out a referral to the secondary and tertiary care will also come down. And that is how we can uh, create more package of services which is responsive to the population's needs. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, the concept of comprehensive primary health care, is it just an old wine in a new bottle? So to understand that, we need to understand that, uh, answer that why do we need comprehensive primary health care and what are the different components of primary comprehensive primary health care or CPSC as we know it. So why comprehensive primary health care? Because of the fragmentation of care disrupts continuity of care and has an impact on clinical outcome. Our care system is highly fragmented. People have lost trust in our public health systems, high dependence on primary health, private health care system which primarily relies on point of care payment system, which is highly iniquitous. Public suffer duality of problems is inflated cost due to fragmented care and poor clinical outcome from lack of continuity of care. I already talked about epidemiological transitions to non-communicable conditions, majority of mortality for, which accounts for majority of mortality for men and among uh, women. The risk factors for non-communicable conditions such as tobacco, alcohol use, etc. need actions at different levels, not just at the tertiary care facilities. So this necessitates a focus on primary and secondary prevention, which basically forms the basis of comprehensive primary health care. And if you'll be able to do that, cost containment is critical as is reducing the load on secondary and tertiary care facilities to reduce the patient load and improve quality.
quality of care. That basically explains why we need a healthcare system which uh, moves from, it is not as abundant, but moves from along with maternal and child health to the other dimensions of care that is important for primary healthcare systems. So within this context, I will now explain what are the different components of comprehensive primary health care. Thank you. Comprehensive primary health care system has got essentially 12 package of services. The first five package of service, which you can see in this slide, care in pregnancy and childbirth, neonatal and infant healthcare services, childhood and adolescent healthcare services, family planning, and management of communicable diseases, which are under our different national health programs, are essentially those programs which has been traditionally the focus of primary healthcare system as we know it. This continues to remain in the comprehensive primary health care. But important are the additional seven points which forms part of the comprehensive primary health care systems. The next slide. Yeah. So here, the seven points include general out of outpatient care for acute simple illnesses and minor ailments. It is not to say that this has never been part of our PSA system. Our PSA system has, uh, has uh, OPD days and all those things in patient bed, but our focus has been overtly on maternal and child health. Here we want to develop, refocus the attention on uh, acute simple illness management, screening and management of non-communicable diseases. Under CPSC or comprehensive primary health care, this is going to be the next big focus because diabetes, hypertension. Hello. Uh, main issues which are happening and putting our populations. The screening and basic management of mental health ailments. Mental health ailments are uh, mental health conditions and management of mental health conditions, at least management at the primary health care systems, are a key driver for comprehensive primary health care. There are a lot of focus at the government of India as well as the state government level. And there have been a national mental health act which basically talks about what can be done for primary prevention of mental health at the primary health care level. Care for common ophthalmic and ENT problems, particularly those which can be managed at the primary health care level as well as basic dental care. Geriatric populations. India is fast moving into an age of you know, geriatric populations. So the burden of geriatric care is increasing. So the CPSC's 11th component is geriatric and palliative health care services. As well as the last but not the least component is trauma care and emergency medical services that can be managed at the primary health care level. So these are the 12 dimensions that makes up the comprehensive primary health care services. And government of India and the state governments are putting in a lot of emphasis. This is something which is not well discussed in popular print media uh, as much as the one NHPS, which I will discuss in the next slide. But this forms a backbone of the Ayushman Bharat program. We are creating a new cadre of health workers who are called mid-level providers or community health officers. In fact, the target is that all the 150,000 odd sub-centers and 40,000 odd primary health centers in India will be transformed under as health and wellness center. This is a term which you might have uh, you know, heard uh, read in the popular media sometimes. So all the sub-centers and primary health centers would be transformed into health and wellness center by 2022. And these centers would basically uh, be able to equip to manage all these 12 dimensions of comprehensive health care. And that is going to be the cornerstone of Ayushman Bharat program along with the NHPS thing, which I'm going to discuss in the next slide now. So Aishman Bharat National Health Protection Scheme, popularly known as Modicare, sometimes termed as the world's largest government funded healthcare program. Of course, that has going to be world's largest program because any scheme, major scheme, which you are going to dis uh, announce in the second most populous country in the world is going to be the largest government funded healthcare program. There's no doubt in that and there is no brainer in it. But if you look into the nuance of it, this National Health Protection Mission or National Health Protection Scheme, the coverage of 5 lakh or 0.5 million per family 
is around 17 times more generous than the Rashtra Swasthya Bhima Yojana, which has been until now uh, in their flagship program. And almost two to four times uh, more generous when compared to other state government funded health insurance schemes in India, which includes schemes like uh, Bajpayee Aragrashi scheme in Karnataka, Rajiv Aragrashi in Andhra Pradesh, uh, CM Comprehensive Health Scheme in Tamil Nadu, or Mukhamad Amritam scheme in Gujarat, and so on and so forth. So it is, I think the plan is that it is still not fully clear. Earlier the plan was that it will be launched on 15th August this year. Now they have extended it to uh, September uh, during the birthday of Dindyal Padhaya. Uh, so I think the contours of that those will, will get more clearer around that time. But the plan is that all the state and central sponsored scheme will be subsumed under the Ayushman Bharat National Health Protection Scheme. The scheme, unlike the Rashtriya Swastha Bhima Yojana, uh, will not just cater to the BPL population, but it will also cater to people in distress who may not be otherwise in the BPL list. And if you remember the speech of the Honorable Prime Minister from the Red Fort on 15th August, he said that you know, this is the first step. Uh, progressively, they will be also covering the middle income and the high income people on a contributory measure. But those contours are still to be clear. But I argue that this is a very intelligent move by the central government because it has increased the coverage without necessarily straining the exchequer. And we can talk about when the scheme was launched, a lot of people had debates around whether this 1200 uh, crore which was allocated for the Ayushman Bharat program, whether that is sufficient. And I argue that yes, for the first year it is sufficient because you are not going to launch the scheme for first, run the scheme for the 12 months, but essentially for about five or six months, as you can see, it is uh, August and it is going to be launched in September and uh, between September and March, you do not have much time. So you don't want to front load everything, but that's, that's the part. That's not the topic for discussions. The target beneficiary of this scheme is 107 million families an estimated 535 million population, which is equivalent to 40% of Indian population. If government of India succeed in doing that, that will be a, a big step towards movement for a moving towards universal health coverage. However, there remains areas of concerns. This is, as Shomitra has mentioned in his talk, that uh, out-of-pocket payment is mostly going towards medicine care, outpatient care. That is unlikely to be covered by uh, the Ayushman Bharat National Health Protection Scheme as it was a few limitations of Rashtriya Swastha Bhima Yojana. I will talk about that in a little moment, but I think that is one area of opportunity for female financial service providers. How can you complement this national health protection scheme? But let us wait for a moment uh, before we discuss this. The other areas of concern, which we saw from Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana and other similar schemes and been well documented are exclusion and self exclusions Why are this happening? Because Poverty and illiteracy, Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana was through an insurance company. Insurance companies has got an incentive to enroll you, but a disincentive to basically give you the information that where should you go when you fall sick, because that would increase the claim ratio. There is a priority for enrolling male members and families because there was a cap of five member per families. Socioeconomic disadvantaged groups, including urban poor, are by and large excluded from the RSBR program. There are limited knowledge about entitlements, limited knowledge about the panel hospitals. This has been key limitations of the Rashtra Swasthya Bhima Yojana. And unless government of India takes a concrete action to address this, there will be huge problem uh, in rollout and movement towards uh, the national uh, universal health coverage under Ayushman Bharat program. So this brings me to the questions. In the next slide, please. The question to, uh, to ponder and question to ponder, particularly for financial sector players such as microfinance groups, such as self help groups or self help promoting institutions, that can the financial sector players be engaged to extend the social protection flows by distributing coverage and supplementing the benefit package that are provided by the National Health Protection Scheme? Our argument is that yes, there is a big role. The government of India has already given a basic level of coverage under the National Health Protection Scheme. So 
I think one need to understand and analyze what have been the exclusion, promote people to get enrolled under the National Health Protection Scheme, but prepare a complementary package of services which are otherwise excluded from the National Health Protection Schemes. This would help people keep healthy and out of hospitals. This will help primary care integrate in the health protections because primary care management is an important cornerstone to keep people healthy and to move into hospitalizations. It will help improve decision making by women because most of uh, our group members, both in MFI and SHGs, 80% of them, more than 80% of them are women. And when we keep the women healthy, the family will automatically become healthy. It will expand the safety net and improve social inclusion in the system as well as expand safety net for migrant workers in Alman Poor. I mean, there are a lot of schemes which we have seen. Annapurna Padivar in Pune, uh, Uplift in Pune, which has worked primarily focused on the Alman Poor and migrant workers. Given the intimate knowledge of the community, there is, an, I think, a huge scope now than ever to complement the benefit package and create a system which is more responsive uh, toward moving towards universal health. I think there, I, I'll end here, stop here. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take those questions as talking about India's journey for universal health care. Thank you. Sabina? Yes, hello. All right, yeah. we, we had a few questions. Um, one question for Soman from Marine of Sini. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right, great. Um, so West Bengal Department of Health and Family Welfare has a separate health insurance for the unorganized sector, the Swastia Sati, that almost replaced the earlier RSBY of the government of India. Is, can you shed any light on the marriage of the state and union government policies? <laughs> right, good. Uh, yes, West Bengal state has got its skin just like many other states such as Gujarat, Karnataka, uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh had, their, had their skin. I think the plan, as you would have seen in the news the popular media, is that this will all be subsumed under the National Health Protection Scheme. Even if you look into the overall contours of the scheme, which is currently out in the popular media, that the central and the state governments will be sharing the cost of the National Health Protection Scheme for a co-bending mechanism. So all the state schemes are supposed to be uh, subsumed under the Ayushman Bharat National Health Protection Scheme. And if popular media uh, articles, because all, most of the contracts would be out on September 18, if I'm not wrong, uh, on the on the date. But if we go by the popular media, what we, what we learned so far is that West Bengal has agreed to co-brand their program and subsume that under the Ayushman Bharat National Health Protection Scheme. Great. Um, then I ha we had a follow-up question also from Maureen. As far as we know, health features in the state list of constitution and Ayushman Bharat is 100% financed by the union government. Will that mean the role of state in health will cease to exist? If not, uh, no. to consider it amount. Okay. So, no, Ayushman Bharat is not, or the National Health Protection Scheme is not a 100% central funded scheme. Uh, as you know that, you know, in the Indian constitution, health is a state subject. Central basically plays, the union government basically plays the role of complementing the state funding for health. So uh, the National Health Protection Scheme, although it is announced in the union budget, it will be co-funded with the state government. So central and the state would basically share the cost of the uh, NHPS. Uh, and uh, this 1200 crore, whatever we basically was allotted initially, was the central share of the uh, union government share under the National Health Protection Scheme. The rest of the money will be also shared by the state government. So that is how it is going to play out, not as a central funded scheme problem. Great. And just a reminder, we're still taking questions. Uh, if you hover your, your uh, cursor over the bottom of the screen, you'll see a chat icon. You click on that and the chat function will open. To put your question in there. Uh, Shamitra, we had one question for you from Harris from Cashport 
or this could be to anybody, but I thought you might be the best to answer. How can we improve health through livelihood in rural communities? Uh, just repeat, Sabina, once again. Sure. How can we improve health through livelihood in rural communities? Ah, well, uh, uh, what I can say very quickly is that if very simply stating if the health of the family or the people who are involved in any kind of livelihood are fine, they are healthy, then automatically they'll be productive and they'll be able to do more work. So what I mean to say, is health is an integrated part of the overall livelihood project or program or vice versa. So if there is any livelihood program, if health can be integrated in terms of the areas that I've shown, like by introducing health education, uh, linking them with the health providers, those who are involved with livelihood, and also as a part of the livelihood, as a part of the financial part of livelihood, if they have some uh, allocation to cover the emergency health cost, then, then this would happen. Great. Um, I have a question. Sorry, I've lost it. From Paritash Singh, how would this scheme, uh, I guess this is for Shoman, how would the scheme address the key issue of low quality healthcare services in primary health centers? Uh, Paritosh, I think your question, when you said scheme, uh, are you meaning by national health protection scheme and how will it address the low quality primary health care? Yeah, that's, that's my assumption. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, uh, national health protection scheme will not touch upon the primary health care. The first thing, it basically will cover secondary and tertiary care illness, primarily in hospitalization related cost. Here, basically, as we have seen in our FBI program, so we will be impaneling, the government will be impaneling both uh, private hospitals as well as public hospitals. Uh, if you look into them, if you're talking about quality of care at that level, there has been several parallel programs like you know improved quality of care at public hospitals of course it is a journey not a destination and we are you know uh, uh, quite distant from the destinations now but there are a lot of quality improvement programs in the public hospitals including national quality assurance standards uh, we are not talking about kayakal program we are talking about touch for liver room quality improvement that is one part for the primary health care you talked about low quality in primary health care for the primary health care, the, the government strategy is the other part of Ayushman Bharat, which I talked in the uh, beginning. It's basically about comprehensive primary health care. So here we are talking from moving from maternal and child health and infection and infectious and community. Real quickly, DS, sorry, DSK, can you go to slide 22 so they can see the Ayushman Bharat, that triangle? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So if, as you will see in the triangle, so its idea is to basically now cover non-communicable conditions, mental health conditions, geriatric conditions. And, you know, it is just not just a slogan that we need to cover these 12 elements with the existing resources. Government of India uh, are, and the state governments are planning to convert all sub-centers, 150,000 odd sub-centers and 40,000 odd primary health care centers uh, as health and wellness center. There will be a separate human resource who would be known as community health officer who will be trained over a six month course, uh, which is called certificate course in community health to basically manage common non communicable conditions, mental health care at the sub center and the primary health care centers. They will be provided additional funding, additional resources to basically uh, improve the quality of the primary health care center. Now, having said so, I understand that there are, of course, human resource vacancies, issues, uh, which we are grappling with. They will continue to be you know, issue in the near, near future, for sure. It is not that this is just a magic bullet. And tomorrow, once we are, they have been named as health and wellness center, everything is going to improve. But however, this is a step that towards basically moving towards universal health care, step towards moving towards quality of care. Uh, there, there are teething problems. There are problems related to contractual staff, problems related to vacancies, medical officer not being uh, there in the headquarters. 
those constraints we are living with and that's why i say it's not ayushman bharat is not going to be a magic bullet it is just a means towards an end so it will take some time uh, before we move towards but the idea behind and you must appreciate that uh, this movement will reduce the flow of patient if it is successful if your primary healthcare system is further strengthened it will reduce the movement to a, from primary care to uh, secondary and tertiary care and by that way it is going hopefully will reduce the outpatient care cost there will be problem which will be there and uh, the government of india the state governments as well as civil societies uh, needs to basically move uh, work together in cohesion uh, towards achieving that uh, yeah i think there is so no much. one answer i can give but yes uh, this is their approach to answering the question yeah. yeah. so man i have a question Sure. Sorry, uh, before we do, just wanted a time check. We are two minutes to the end of the hour. Uh, with We've got a couple more questions, so we're going to go an extra 10 minutes if people need to go to another meeting. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this session. As I mentioned, it will be recorded, or it is being recorded, and it will be posted and shared with everybody. Um, go ahead, DSK. Yeah, I have a question to Soman. When you look at the array of services that are expected to be provided by these health and wellness clinics, the human resource requirement appears to be huge and a variety of disciplines are to be covered. Maybe the ultimate goal is to develop into such a comprehensive service provider, but it may take quite some time. Correct. But in the meantime, I would like you to quickly tell us uh, which are the areas where the microfinance sector can, could contribute particularly in respect of uh, providing comprehensive primary health care and what kind of supplementary role or supportive role they could play here. Uh, that is something which will be of interest to us. Correct. I think in my opinion and based on the research that we have, uh, uh, discussions we had with different stakeholders, I think a lot, lot of potential for microfinance providers. But I think the traditional approach of health insurance or community-based health insurance or micro-insurance which microfinance providers have been exploring, exploring uh, which I have seen in the past, they are unlikely to succeed because most of those coverages are now being provided through NHPS, will now be provided through NHPS. Yeah. So where does the role of financial service providers come? It is basically to identify what are the gaps. So A, motivate your, your clientele, clientele, motivate your beneficiaries to enroll in the national health protection schemes because there is no point replicating what government is already doing. B, to develop a top-up package, if I can say so, a top-up plan, which can, with the low cost, because now, you know, most of your majority of the cost burden is not taken care of by the NHPS. Mm -hmm. So, create a low-cost model, a health protection scheme, which will act as a top-up scheme to the NHPS, and which can be community-funded, community-managed, much like a health mutual type scheme which can take care of primary healthcare needs of your populations. And which would include outpatient care, which would include cost of medications. And if we just take care of these two major things, 70% of your out-of-pocket expenditure cost will be taken care of. And believe me that this will not take a lot of effort, but it just needs careful planning. The basic problem why I understand why NHPS has avoided out-of-pocket expenditure out, uh, sorry, OPD cost so far is because this is a very, you know, a healthcare system in India is highly fragmented and having a one size fits all model does not work. There has been a lot of pilot, there have been about 12 pilot under RSBY to cover OPD care and all of them have miserably failed. Let me tell you that as well. And this is a documented fact. They are funded, well funded, it failed. It didn't work because they worked on a one size fits all. That is where, you know, given your client population base, Given your intimate knowledge of the community, that is where microfinance institute can play an important role. Good. Thank you. Particularly the cost of medicine. Yeah. Um, is uh, Rishi online? Rishi, I'm unmuting you. Uh, DSK, can you go forward to slide <clears throat> after the question, slide 29? Rishi Kumar from Freedom from Hunger India Trust attended a, an event, a, a UHC event. He's going to give us a quick readout from that, which I think is also relevant uh, to what 
to DSK's question. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sabina, for giving this uh, time slot to talk about this. Am I audible to everyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I last month I attended a, a workshop on uh, this universal healthcare, and there were some recommendations from the workshop that is going to the some uh, representatives of uh, international NGO, those are going to meet Prime Minister and Health Minister of India and discuss about these points. So the point one is the social and political action required. So basically it is being shared in the in that workshop with most of the health NGOs working on the ground. They feel like there is a lack of social uh, collectivization around health. People are not much aware about it and they are not actually uh, of that influence level so that they can influence the policies. So there should be some work should be done uh, under USC to social uh, to make these uh, health issue as more uh, social connected and make it a policy uh, influence uh, strategy. So how to connect it uh, to the policy level that is the major uh, recommendation from the uh, that workshop that there should be a strategy to uh, make some policies as per the social mobilization methodologies. Second point that was emphasis upon the promotive and the preventive care. The point came up like uh, uh, so was also sharing that uh, there are primary second and tertiary care mechanism. So what happens in the villages in the rural India populations that uh, when the disease comes into the house, they does not uh, go to a health checkup or something and they wait for two, three days or four days when the condition becomes more critical. So in that time, the primary health care system and secondary health care system, they suddenly become a failure. They just refer them to a tertiary uh, health care system. So it creates a burden over that on a tertiary care system. So just to reduce that burden, the uh, promotive and preventive care practices should be involved in the village level. So the health education methodologies that Freedom from Hunger India and uh, other health NGOs are doing at the grassroots level, they should be promoted so that people become more aware about the healthy practices and healthy care services that they can opt. Third point was on the regulate uh, this private health sector from pharma insurance to medical schools and more. So that is basically more for the urban sector that is uh, happening like uh, it was sharing from some uh, youth groups of uh, these ANMs and uh, nursing students they are actually practicing uh, nursing uh, uh, they, are, they, they are actually working as nurses in the, the private hospitals. So their concern was that uh, there is much dependent upon dependence upon uh, the doctor services right now. There are several things that can be actually uh, get treated or checked up by a uh, nursing staff, but everyone uh, prefers to go for a doctor. So there is a clear mismatch that availability of the doctors and the number of patients. For an example, they shared that in the Delhi Safdarjan hospital, there was vacancy for 500 uh, nursing staff and the total application came for 19,000. So there is a huge pool of people who are available to work for the health sector, but there are no uh, specific places to place such people in the healthcare system. So how to work upon them? How we can develop more paramedical staffs so that uh, the healthcare services can reach more easily? So that is the point raised uh, uh, by urban healthcare system providers. So and the th fourth point is integrate top down planning with bottom up community participation. Again, it is from the grassroots perspective that main ma mainly planning is done on the basis of uh, some survey, some the basis of some random interviews or something. But there is no perfect platform to integrate the top down approach and the down top approach to come together. So how to bring that uh, into a homogeneous, in a homogeneous thing that is the major concerns and most of the uh, perspectives of the communities get missed out in most of the plannings and there is a uh, trend of having a universal planning system like it's like uh, to, in the top to down approach that everything comes from the top and it goes to the every state every district every blocks and most of the things like people were sharing in this that they, these are not applicable uh, on their fields fifth one that states adapt systems specific to need context it's related to the above point that how we contextualize these health policies and health services that uh, government is trying to reach. 
so the contextualization and state specific plans are completely missing so if i talk about madhya pradesh jharkhand chatisgarh all these states are mostly tribal rich belts and their context is totally different from the context of the rajasthan or the north indian states there so there should be some contextualization planning that should be uh, needed at the ground level so that should be part of these uh, usc policies and the last one is mechanism for community based monitoring for health services this is like uh, adding governance angle to this health systems that most of the health services are being monitored by their specific department so like nrga and other schemes being monitored by some social audits and something so there should be some social mechanism to monitor health services as well at uh, gram panchayat level or at the village level itself so these were the major recommendations came out of that workshop many uh, ngos participated it was organized by who and seva phfi and phi and many renowned ngos working on health in this uh, in the indian states uh, took participate in this uh, workshop and this is the basic recommendation that they provided so that's it from my side thank you rishi um, I have another question from Sudhir Data from Aikyatan Development Services, and I'm not sure if this was answered already. But is there any role for NGOs in Aishman Bharat? And I don't know. Maybe this would be good for Shamitro to answer. Maybe talk about the um, partnership, the linkages to um, state and local government that could be created. Or would you like to answer that? Uh, well, uh, I'm not very sure, maybe Shoman be, will be able to, but so far I know uh, the government would be looking for private partnership, including the NGOs, in terms of providing services, uh, either at the level of the primary uh, and, and to some extent the secondary care. So they are looking primarily for those organizations who are involved in uh, health services in terms of uh, the clinics, uh, medicine, uh, you know, or, or, or I mean, hospitalization. So that's the partnership they're looking for currently. Maybe, unless, yeah, sorry, unless maybe, until, maybe you can talk a little bit about how um, NGOs can drive demand and show. Yes, yeah, I'm coming to that. So okay. this is what this is what exactly they have in terms of the partnership with the NGOs or the corporate sector. However, as a lot of us spoken, including Rishi, that, that one area where we really need to focus is to, in terms of the promote, promoting and preventing health, is to go for education straight away. And that's one area where government may not be in a position. So NGO can really play the part in building awareness, simply giving them information about what Aishman Bharat is, uh, you know, all the, uh, uh, like in RSBI, it failed because of lack of education. So not only that, but also in terms of the preventive health that we have been doing so, and you can do that complementary with the government. So that would also reduce the cost of the government, uh, smoothen, you know, uh, uh, specific high cost of the treatment. So that's one thing NGOs can do. Um, great. I would like to go to the last section. Mark, could you tell us a little bit about the Global UHC moment, a movement and moments that civil society are, can engage? Uh, yes, uh, uh, just briefly, given the, uh, the time, there's a uh, are going to be a number of major meetings coming up within the next year, which will have a focus on universal health coverage. The first is happening in a few weeks' time at the UN General Assembly, which is going to include a universal health coverage conference, which is going to promote next year's high-level meeting. Uh, in October, we have uh, a conference in Berlin, which the World Health Organization has organized, which will include a, a launch of the WHO replenishment. Um, and then we have a, a global conference on primary health care taking place in Kazakhstan at the end of October. And uh, importantly, in 
uh, September of next year uh, as part of the uh, the UN General Assembly next year will be the first high-level meeting on universal health coverage. The UN has had high-level meetings on specific health issues, but uh, this will actually uh, focus on the overall issue of universal health coverage because something that um, uh, certainly the Results International Network has been working towards is the... You know, um, the high level meeting on TB, which is coming up in a few weeks' time. So, uh, this will, uh, next year's um, focus will be on the health system more broadly. And obviously, addressing any specific disease like TB relies on having an effective overall health system. Uh, next slide, please. Sabina? Um, uh, yes, we, uh, we've got the two slides, so um, the, the slide up. So uh, the, the two countries that are hosting the G7 and the G20 both are making health a priority. So uh, France will be the uh, president of the G7, which is the seven largest um, economies in the world. Uh, and uh, so they will be including the universal health coverage on its agenda in 2019. And Japan uh, is the host of the G20, and the G20 is uh, obviously a significant group for us as, um, as participants in the call because both India and Australia are members of the G20, and it will Japan will be, as the president of the G20, also promoting universal health coverage. And uh, at the moment, the draft declaration for the 2018 G20 Health Ministers Meeting, which is taking place in a month's time, uh, does include a section on health system strengthening, which is a, uh, a sign that the G20 is in preparation for increased attention to this issue next year, already having a focus on um, the health systems overall. So that's a, a brief summary of some of the uh, major meetings and the focus of international forums on uh, universal health coverage over the next year.